Hello, I'm uh, Barry Shaw from The View from Israel. Um, by the wonders of Skype, I'm speaking to you from here in Netanya, Israel, connected uh, via Stockholm, Sweden, by my friend uh, Lawrence Berger and producer of uh, Cool TV. Um, today, we'll be talking about the subject, perhaps the only subject in your life right now, which is the Corona virus, the Wuhan virus, the China virus, whatever you want to call it. And the idea came from Lawrence himself when I was chatting to him about this issue. Uh, he said it would be a good idea to have a, uh, a program in which I could give you the perspective of how we're coping and what's happening here in Israel and do a comparative study with what has been happening at the same time in Sweden, Lawrence's country. And I'm very thankful to Lawrence for introducing me to our special guest who will give the Swedish perspective. And I'd like to welcome to the show, Dr. Michael Kohn. Welcome to The View from Israel, Michael. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, it's a pleasure to be with you, Barry, uh, on the show. I, uh, first time I, I'm uh, listening or being part of the show. And uh, I think this is a very interesting discussion because whenever I speak to any Israeli or American, I get questions about Sweden. And uh, so I think there's a lot of interest here for what's going on. I think it's going. To, I think it's going to be very interesting to our listeners. But before we get into the details of the of the virus thing, uh, give us uh, some of your background. You're a, a doctor in Sweden, but uh, tell us something about your family history. Go back a generation. Oh, generation. Okay, I'm I'm uh, uh, first generation Swedish. My parents came uh, from the war. They, uh, my father came as an 11-year-old, uh, 39, on a kinder transport from Germany uh, with his grandmother. Uh, he was happy to be able to be uh, able to stay in, in Stockholm as an 11-year-old um, uh, during the war. He experienced uh, the November pogroms in Berlin. He went to the only Jewish school there in Berlin and managed to, his parents were smart enough to get him out of, out of Germany in time. So he went to school here in Sweden and, and grew up. And uh, then uh, right after the war, my mother uh, came to Sweden. She's Hungarian and came from the Holocaust from the, through the white ambulances, the Bernadotte, the rescue operation that rescued also um, very many Hungarian Jewish uh, women. And uh, they met as young uh, teenagers and got married and uh, had three, three children. I'm the middle one. And... Um, and uh, as a good Jewish boy, uh, you know, you become a doctor and train medicine and then uh, you go into business. <laughs> so I I'm, I'm, uh, have a combination of being uh, uh, an MD and a businessman and also very Zionistic. Uh, my father always said, you know, if, if um, his parents managed to escape to Norway and perished from there. So he always said... Uh, if there would have been in Israel uh, at that time, uh, you would have had grandparents. And uh, so you become very Zionistic, and, and uh, he was very, and I also been engaged myself in the, in the Jewish community here. And uh, now I'm president of Karen Isod, uh for Sweden. Uh, that's a, a short, and, but I also have a foot in Israel because I have two sons uh, who live in, who's been locked down in Tel Aviv. So I've been following that. The virus pretty pretty closely and and what israel has been doing i managed to get out of israel middle of january myself and went to the states and came back to sweden when the lockdown was really in in place so and i'm also um active in the business in israel i'm actually ceo of a startup we will talk about it later and um, um, being very active in the old age long-term care so i'm very very, very involved in the long-term care and the healthcare uh, situation because our device is an uh, is, um, incontinence device, an external incontinence device for women. And the, the main market is long-term care and home care for elderly, elderly women. So I've been following uh, what's going on very closely in, in this place also. So uh, that I, have a, I, I will tell you, I'm not an epidemiologist, I'm not a virologist, but I, I have followed both the debate, the political debate, and the medical, uh, uh, so that's going to be a conversation around these topics. Okay, 
So I think I think this chat of ours is going to be very informative and instructive and uh, interesting to to our viewers and listeners. So look, the China virus has hit us all, and uh, there's been a lot of suffering in every country, some more than others. Um, part of this is basically is how our individual uh, governments and uh, and health uh, experts have managed the crisis, and uh, the information. Uh, and it's useful to be make a comparison on the approach taken by, let's say, Sweden and Israel uh, to this and how we're doing. Um, first of all, Michael, I'm interested to learn about the attitude and the reaction for the sudden arrival of this uh, and the effect of this uh, virus. Um, by that, I mean, uh, do Swedes discuss how, for instance, suddenly over a short period, thousands of Swedes suddenly started dying and getting seriously sick with a virus? And do people really question and even hold China responsible for the global spread of the virus? Or do they take it, well, it was spread and it's by some sort of anonymous uh, sort of um, delivery? Uh, the, the, the Chinese discussion is, is not that active. I think um, the, 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 what's on people's mind here is here and now. How do I protect myself? How do, how do we manage this? And, and in Sweden, you haven't, you know, it took some time before you, and, and still we haven't really taken very stern actions here in Sweden. And, and, and uh, the health authorities said it's going to pass when people came back from Italy with, with infections. And, and the spread was uh, uh, going inside of Sweden. They said it's going to pass. We passed the peak. And they've been kind of playing down the, 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 the danger of, of, of what's going to happen here. So I don't think people sort of are in the blame game yet. Um, uh, the discussion is internal here. How, how do we fight it? What's the right way? Uh, because we have we have a lot of deaths here compared to even our neighboring countries, uh, Denmark and Norway, which we we compare more to that than to Israel because it's closer, and and the strategies are totally different uh, between the countries. So that's kind of the discussion that's going on here. The, the the everybody knows China is China. Everybody knows that you know this is an authoritarian uh, government. We had spread of SARS and and such from there before. And and uh, the people who are in the, in in uh, southeast in in Asia, they were more, more very much more alert to the danger than Sweden because we didn't ever had the SARS ep epidemic coming here. So so uh, this is um, the, the, I, I I call it the COVID. The China game is going to continue later on, and uh, uh, we will hear more about that. But I think that's going to be part of the aftermath. Oh, I, I, Michael, I've been in, involved not only in researching but also advocating about the uh, China's criminal responsibility by their negligence, uh, in certain cases deliberate negligence, but also other criminal acts. Um, and I do this because, quite frankly, you know, even in civilian life, you can be uh, found guilty of uh, negligence um, and be fined or even in prison, for instance, if you drive a car carelessly and you injure or, or kill somebody, even worse, uh, you can be put on charges. But, and, that, and there is ample evidence in holding China responsible for the death and destruction of what has happened in your country, both physical, health-wise, death, economically and ours and others. And there are a number of uh, countries who are now waking up to this and holding China uh, 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 responsible for this. But I don't go into, into the, this isn't a, going to be a legal discussion, but I think it's one, a discussion and a debate that ought to take place in Sweden as well. Um, but a, I'm also interested in finding out from you the way that actually the authorities and the health experts and the, um, uh, the government have approached how to tackle uh, the, the virus outbreak in Sweden. Did you go into an immediate or, or gradual lockdown or have you applied really the, the herd immunity attitude to fighting the, the, the virus, the effect of the virus? 
Uh, it's a good question. The, 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 the Swedish authorities really, uh, really did not reveal their strategy uh, publicly. It was, uh, there has been a lot of articles debating, you know, what is the strategy? What, what, are, you, what are you planning? And, and there initially was a talk about herd immunity. Um, uh, the peak was passed, uh, was going to be passed a few weeks after Italy when people came back from the winter vacation in Italy. And then it was a spread internally. And, and, and the, the, the policy has been uh, recommendations to the public. Wash your hands, social distancing, uh, really no interventions by the government, no forceful quarantining people, quarantining people, tracking people. And now the spread is pretty uh, widespread. You cannot do that anymore. Um, and, and still, there is only public recommendations. You you still can have uh, congregation of, of more than ten people, uh, forty nine people. That they closed, I think, four restaurants because it was too crowded, and they opened them again a week later. Um, so so the restaurants still open. It's still about washing your hands, social distancing, no mouth guards. Um, so it's very much a trust. Do as we say, and you will be fine. Um, the problem is not everybody does what you say anymore. We have we have a, a mixed uh, uh, there's a generation issue where where young people are very active outside. We also have a million immigrants from country, other countries who doesn't trust the gov government and authorities like a, a Swedes do. There is a contract in Sweden between uh, the people and and the government that. The government will care for you from your you're born until you are dead, and we trust them. And you see in the policy in the polls yesterday, the Social Democrats that has been managing the the crisis here, or, or no, I would say not managing the crisis, has has gained five percent in, in the polls. So this says something about even we have these high death figures. Uh, you trust the leadership. Maybe it's a human thing that in a deep crisis that's what you have to do because you don't have any other options than to trust them. So, so you know, when democracy is when you can you you can afford to fail. Uh, now we cannot afford to fail. So you trust what you have, and I think that I think the discussion with China, how people managed it, the economy, everything like this will come in the aftermath. I think everybody's very busy trying to manage their lives, their companies, the the the, the economics, the personal uh, crisis. That's actually uh, the same for everybody. Uh, it surprises me what you've just said, uh, and I'm going to ask Lawrence to put up um, on the screen the, uh, the recent statistics as you and I speak together. The fact that you say that the uh, ruling government or uh, the ruling power is actually increasing in popularity, when you look at the statistics, I found this startling. It may be that the Swedes aren't looking at the statistics um, because what we're finding, look, Sweden and Israel have more or less or closely the same size of population. You have 10 million. We are now 9.2. But you have had a, in excess of 21,000 Swedes infected. We are still below 16,000. But the main statistic that's most startling is your death rate, your fatalities as, as of this time, is 2,586. Our death rate is 222. A vast difference. This, to me, looks like the success of our system and the total failure of yours. I can't believe that Swedes are indifferent to massive deaths of their fellow countrymen and people to such a massive degree that they would actually sort of shake it off and say, well, OK, the, the government's doing a fine job. I, I can't see that. But even also the other statistics I've had preparing for the show, which I hope that Lawrence will show our viewers as well, is how Sweden is faring among the Scandinavian countries. The, all the other Scandinavian countries have uh, death rates in the triple figures. Maximum being Denmark with 452, Norway 210, and Finland 211. Again, Sweden's figures 2,586. Also, the infection rate 
21, 22,000 in Sweden, 7,700 in Norway, 9,000 in Denmark, less than 5,000 in, in Finland. So even in Scandinavian scale, you seem to be uh, failing there. The, the other item in preparation to speaking for you, Michael, uh, just before we went on air, I went on to a BBC site which had the headline on from the 25th of April saying, has Sweden got its science right? And it seems that um, as a discussion or a confrontation, if you, if you have such things as confrontations in Sweden, between the um, or architect of the Swedish virus strategy, Anders Tegnell, who said, we are doing, what we're doing is working and in a sense, we're beating it. If beating it is having a death rate approaching 3,000, it's hardly a, a way of uh, beating it. But on, on the other side, uh, there were questions about Tegnell's leadership. Uh, Dr. Claudia Hansen from the Karolinska uh, Institute is among 22 scientists who wrote that, and I quote, these people are officials without talent, uh, and they've been put in charge of the decision making. Um, question to you is, what do you know about this? And has Sweden's exceptionalism been costly in, in human terms, do you think? Uh, yeah, the, uh, <laughs> this is a big question. I, I will try to give you a little background what, you know, the, the, about the, the Swedish culture here. Yeah. Uh, uh, yes, there is a uh, uh, there is a feeling in Sweden about uh, being exceptional, and it's an, an exceptionalism in Sweden. We we have had peace for 350 years. We have a very uh, good, you know, economic system. People are are healthy, uh, live longer, uh, happier than in most countries. Um, we have a democracy. We like to uh, to export our democracy feeling of how to run things are the right way. We are very, very, very secular. Sweden is one of the most secular countries in in the world. And what happened in Sweden is that um, um, bureaucracy or the or the gov the governing the politicians really handed off a lot of responsibility to the technocrats, to the to the. Um, uh, and, and they are not politicians, they're technocrats. They, they do a theory, the consequences are not there, they have their job, and the politicians uh, uh, can say that we, we, we left it to take, we follow their advice, we don't know anything about this, so we follow their advice, and then who is responsible? So that's one issue in the end. Uh, how, how, do you, how, are Swe how is Sweden gonna manage the, let's say, the blame game for these numbers? The, the, the other is, because there is no accountability really here, and, and Sweden is not good on accountability because everything is, it's a lot of consensus here. You are, you compromise, you don't argue too much, um, but there has been a lot of debate in the papers about, obviously about the strategy, because the numbers speak for themselves. And and there was a big article, uh, and, and what the major newspaper, Dagens Nyheter, is quite critical about the strategy. And, but Anders Tegnell, as of yesterday, said he's not sure the strategy is right anymore. And, and this illustrates that they've been backing down from day one. If, when, when, <clears throat> when, I came, when I came to Sweden from Frankfurt, uh, March, March 6, nobody was looking at me. Nobody took my temperature. Nobody asked anything. I just walked right in. There was no quarantine. quarantine. Israel had, by then, 14 days quarantine for everybody that came from abroad. You couldn't come into Israel without that. I just walked straight into the country. I could have come from uh, Tehran. I could have come from any place where there had been outbreaks and nobody asked me. So the spread was then already not controlled. Um, and there were, and, but remember, we had peace for 350 years. Israel has uh, an emergency, uh, a readiness for emergencies because of the wars and everything. So this is a, a huge cultural difference, mindset difference on on, on a crisis like this is a war, it's a war against the virus. And, and Israel is, can implement all its tools, the, the, the military, the, 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 the you know, controlling terrorists, you can track people, uh, you know where they are. So if you keep the numbers down, you can then, when you let it up, track these people and, and not get the second wave because the second wave is what's been discussed here. 
it, in the end, we all going to be the same. When you let up, there's going to be a second wave. And in the end, we're all going to have the same amount of death, the numbers of, of deaths. So in the beginning, it says we can control it. Uh, the second wave, we, in the end, there's going to be the same numbers because uh, what do you do when you let it up? And, and uh, so we have the right way and we're doing the herd immunity. They, they gave up the herd immunity argument now because they don't know, they don't know if you even get immune. So the herd immunity, you know, it's, it's, a, non, it's a non-argument because you don't know about the immunity even if it happens. So in Sweden, they've given you different theories and backing down step by step, they've been backing down, abandoning their old statements. And, and the interesting thing is under Signal, as you mentioned, it's still very popular, and people go back him, uh, and he's been wrong. You know, they, you know, week after week, he's been backing down. So, and the wow. numbers speak for themselves. Now he's himself starting to back down and getting concerned. I saw a headline. I didn't read the article, but you know, we can expect twenty thousand deaths and so on in Sweden. Oh. Uh, and and it's yeah, it's a technocrat. He's not. It's not, a, and it's not a religious society. We. We don't live together with our elderly. We put them in homes. We, we have other people taking care of them. So you don't have that close contact with your parents. And re- the religious, the value systems is, is kind of more, maybe more economical, uh, more, uh, and, 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 and these are technocrats. And the technel is a, is a, you know, a scientist or, or, or was. Um, yeah. So, so that plays a role in, in, in how you tackle this thing. And, and we, the, yeah. Sorry, we have, the, you mentioned the religious thing. Actually, this was actually um, um, an issue, turned out to be an issue here when it came to fighting the virus. Uh, let me give you or, or our, our viewers a bit of a summary of uh, how we approached it. Really, it was led by our Prime Minister, Benjamin Netanyahu, uh, when he knew that we had a problem here in Israel. One of the things he did was he got his health advisors together. He also got the military together, uh, but he also outreached to world leaders. And he had to make a decision which direction Israel would go. Would it be the Swedish model or the British model with the herd immunity system? Or would it be the lockdown system? And he decided to go on the route of isolation. But instead of doing it immediately, he knew the Israeli public wouldn't accept that. He had to impose a gradual lockdown so that he would ease people into self-isolation. It, there were certain sort of uh, avenues that he left open that were closed uh, a bit slightly later. Um, but for instance, uh, we had a, a lockdown of industry, of all the shops, shopping malls and all the shops eventually, until, until we had a total lockdown. Now, uh, what we, and also this was backed up by having the, 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 the prime minister and also health experts uh, talk to us in the evening news broadcasts of how we should behave. It was done also by certain um, almost like advertising videos virtually showing us the risk of uh, doing simple things like opening up a, a, a door handle to a building and carrying your, the infections on your fingers and shaking hands to somebody or delivering something or pressing uh, the, the button in an elevator and, and then passing that, that, uh, that infection on to others. A, a sort of a startling video to educate the Israeli public. And then it went well. Certainly we had a certain problem with our young selfie generation who uh, wanted to crowd and herd uh, whatever instincts, but they, you know went into lockdown. I think also something that you said, that Israel is, is accustomed to emergencies, terror attack, war, rocket attacks, and we know how to quickly put ourselves out of harm's way. Uh, and this was done. The only weak link with this is been, has been the ultra-Orthodox community who, were, who live uh, isolated themselves from the Israeli secular living. A lot of them don't even, for instance, have televisions. They have their own cultural, (laughs) religious uh, uh, environment over there and are somewhat isolated. It took them a very long time before they wanted to listen to the warnings and it was almost like imposed on them 
It was an imposed lockdown to which they originally they rebelled against. In fact, there have been certain instances where, for instance, one ultra-Orthodox person took a flight from New York. He knew he was infected, didn't declare it to anybody, infected the people on the plane flying into Israel, and then went to wherever he went, B'nai Brak or, or places in Jerusalem. And another one who went from Tiberias, knowing he was infected, but he wanted to get back to uh, Jerusalem, his home in Jerusalem, for the Sabbath, for Shabbat, and he took a bus. Uh, and what Israel has introduced, we have worked with this with in the system have been, for instance, the Mossad and the Shin Bet, which is the external and internal intelligence units of uh, Israel security. The Mossad, for instance, uh, were doing some amazing and covert things in the desperate need for equipment and uh, protective clothing. Um, they were instrumental in bringing in large supplies of ventilators and other equipment and protective clothing from certain countries, including countries that really only have covert relationship with Israel. Uh, and that helped our stockpile. Uh, but why I mentioned that, we were also using artificial intelligence and everything to trace and track down people who are known uh, to have been infected and yet were still wandering around. And one of those was a Haredi ultra-Orthodox guy who took a bus from Tiberias to Jerusalem and the bus was intercepted and the guy was arrested. And there have been other cases like that. Now, countries like America would look on that as in impringement on, on privacy and things like this. But the Israeli attitude, based on something you said before, having to face with terrorism, Somebody going around infected with a deadly disease is looked on as almost like a terrorist. Not okay, well, herd immunity. Either people will get well or people will get sick or people maybe die. We don't tolerate that sort of attitude. This is probably due to our experiences, our contemporary experiences, and also probably the Chudush Hashem of, of, of respecting every life. P person who saves one life is as if he saves the whole world. It's such Jewish ethics. Yeah. I would have thought that if Sweden had been a Jewish country, there is no way we were tolerated figures going to even be up to a, uh, beyond a thousand, never mind approaching 3,000 with some sort of... Um, uh, I, 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 yeah, Sweden, Sweden, yeah. Sweden is... Um, uh, the, 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 the religion here, the, the Christian, the Lutheran religion, which is the most pre predominant here, has basically the same values regarding uh, life as Jewish. It's based on the Jewish ethics. So uh, uh, th that is a kind it's of... It's a moral value. I'm it's a moral about. value, but also being the secular. And I think the... the, the um, uh, when, when the politicians abdicate and are not really, there is no accountability. I think also Bibi Netanyahu is a very uh, vain person, we know that, and his yeah. aftermath is very important to him, and he would be judged on how many lives would, 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 would be destroyed. That would be the, 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 his legacy, and, and he's sensitive to that. Uh, that's why he didn't go into Gaza with, with man, with people to fight, uh, to fight uh, Hamas in Gaza, because he would lose lives. I think that's one of the biggest reasons. He wouldn't, wouldn't, uh, he wouldn't win anything. So he, he actually didn't fight these wars to save lives. So but, it's, can, but it's also, but it's also, sorry to interrupt, Michael, but it's also a moral responsibility. Absolutely. I think it's a moral responsibility that too many European leaders are lacking. Well, I, I think the, uh, the Germans have been now quite successful. Uh, Angela Merkel has, uh, they've done a really good job in Germany. Uh, uh, the Europeans, it's a mixed that's, bag. That's based on their Teutonic efficiency rather than a moral thing, I think. Uh, well, you know, there, there is moral there too. Uh, <laughs> some people, I, I, think, I think Angela Merkel has, has uh, a decent moral. I wouldn't, yes. I wouldn't put ourselves okay, I agree. On, high, on high horses. Uh, I agree. Uh, there are the people who have very high moral. There are, there are, however, cultural. Uh, as you say, I don't think Sweden could have, even if they wanted to, to, to impose these um, um, uh, measures, because they were not, they hadn't rehearsed them. They, 
there was no uh, there were no mechanisms in in play uh, to centralize uh, uh, managing crisis in a centralized way to impose um, surveillance because we don't have those mechanisms in place because we don't do that uh, you do that because of your, your of, of terrorism and you have you have you have your own very special you can also you also have one international airport it's easy to close off uh, yeah. we could have closed uh, stockholm you know stockholm airport is the biggest airport it could have been done we only have two or three so it could have been done in sweden but the culture the the the, the history the 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 way we do things with consensus not imposing things but a lot of volunteer volunteering not really doing blaming anybody you know a lot of things anything goes here it, yeah. it, it that's why they did not i don't think it was because they really believed and had a strategy because they didn't really show the strategy here until now and and now it's starting to get late we are starting to have too many people and we knew and then we need to be make a draconic uh, lockdown we don't have we don't have the plateau now the numbers are rising in the second a city in Sweden, Gothenburg, they are increased, have an increased uh, um, ventil uh, rate of, of people going into the hospital. Stockholm is maybe plateauing, but there are other places now are, are increasing. So we are not we are not through with this here in Sweden. And and I think it's because that was the easy way to do. It didn't require too much and we hoped it would work. And it was not an active, a very active decision. And, and, and not the coordinated uh, management, not not a real leadership. And I think that's going to be the discussion. When this is over, those 5% is going to go away, that they increase the popul popularity. And, and I hope that's going to be a, a, a discussion based on these numbers. Yeah. Um, as I said, it's sad. It's a thing of sadness, really, that, uh, as I mentioned before, that the ultra-Orthodox uh, uh, communities in, in, in Israel were slow in coming into the game and really understanding the lethality of what we're facing. And that bumped up the statistics. Otherwise, our figures would have been a, a lot lower. Um, recently, very recently, last few days, the rising numbers are now seem to be among the uh, some Arab communities and also the Bedouin. And it may be, um, this is uh, meant as a personal slide, that maybe these people are less disciplined than the Israelis uh, per se have become. Uh, but the other statistic uh, that has been troubling is the of obviously the death of the, the vulnerable, mainly the elderly uh, people in nursing houses, homes that have, um, have died here in Israel because of the, uh, the virus and the effects of the virus. In your statistics in Sweden, do you know what are what the rates of the, of the elderly or people with pre-existing conditions with regard to the death rate? It's, uh, that's where we, we get the majority of our figures. 90% of the death are mm. from age 70 and up, and I think it's 80% from 80 plus, uh, something like that. Uh, so we, the, 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 it's the elderly that are vulnerable. Uh, we did not manage um, to protect them. We have about... In Stockholm, I think two thirds of the elderly homes have COVID infection inside. Uh, um, so there is a disaster going on there. How did uh, they get there? By they, the kids coming to visit, or by the workers? Uh, it was staff? it was staff. It's uh, you also have we also you you know you mentioned that the Orthodox the ultra Orthodox uh, society the Bedouin and the Arab, and and we also have. Uh, uh, immigrant societies, which are a little outside the society, they might not identify with the main culture and follow advice because they are not integrated fully, like in Israel. We have the same here in Sweden. A lot of these people work in the healthcare sector, helping the elderly, home care, low low pay jobs. A lot of uh, a lot of uh, immigrants have those jobs, and and also the the fact that the COVID is asymptomatic. You can actually spread it without symptoms. So even if you, if if you feel good, you can spread it. And they, it, it came yeah. through the staff. It came through the staff, and and now they're testing staff. There was not personal protection um, equipment. Um, people stayed home. They took in new people who didn't know hygiene rules. So th there are a number of factors that you could not protect the elderly. And and some of the arguments I've heard is like. Yeah, but they would die anyway later this year, you know, one or two years later, they would all die. So, you know, these are people who would have died within, uh, you know, a short time anyway. 
So I think that's kind of one of the excuses you hear. But it's 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 it's, oh. it's a disaster in that area. Yeah, it's, that's so, so I, I found that a bit of a cynical attitude to take. All life is uh, yeah. precious, but yeah. um, you know, one conclusion that I, I personally seem to have come to is that um, the uh, the and it's contrary to what I said before that the elderly and the health uh, uh, vulnerable people should be kept safely uh, isolated. But there's a sense in the fading out of the uh, stage of the, the virus to allow people up to the age of 59, let's say, to return to work. Based on the statistics, we find that one or two people or people may come down with the, with the sickness, but it, up to a certain age group, that they, like you mentioned, the mortality rate is very low. Um, uh, and in effect, this again, I repeat, contrary to what I said before, that maybe at this stage of the, the virus control, that this herd immunity might uh, help people develop antibodies and become immune to this, and therefore they will perhaps not be a carrier even to the, uh, the elderly at some stage in the future. And it would also help the country, yours and ours, to get the economy back on track and get people to feel more productive uh, people again, rather than be locked down at home and the contrary sort of um, social norms and habits that can lead to a breakdown of marriage, violence, drugs, drink, suicides, or whatever for being unemployed. What do you say about that? Uh, we are learning about this. Uh, virus. Uh, the herd immunity seems to be a theory that might not be uh, productive because we don't know if you really create a long-term immunity at all with the virus. Right. Um, so, so the herd immunity theory is is uh, uh, very risky at this point, and, and this this carries on to you know if you can find a vaccine or not. So, so I think that the, the um, and this is what other countries have done, like Australia, New Zealand, Israel is doing, not to let uh, uh, to hold it at a low level that you can track and contain the virus. Uh, the containment, the the, the 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 hammer, and then going after the the, the cases to keep the. The, this um, uh, ratio of spreading to under one, that one person spread it to less than one more person. And, and, and that way you can suppress the, the, the prevalence of the, of the virus in the population, and then you can ex get rid of it. Uh, and, and, and to do that, if you let it up, like we've done in Sweden, uh, the volume of, 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 of the volume of people to track and, and uh, asymptomatic carriers, prevent this kind of strategy. You, you cannot really uh, track and isolate that many people. In Israel, Denmark and Norway and Finland, who has been more draconic in the lockdown, um, can now uh, decrease the number of, of and, and with intensive testing also. Sweden has maybe a, a quarter or a fifth of the testing of Israel, and Israel is not happy with it. And we, the, 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 the Sweden, the Swedish social minister said, health minister said, we're well, going to go up to 100,000 tests per week. That's what, in, in, and that's going to happen in two, three weeks. Israel is doing it already uh, at, the, at that frequency, and they're not happy with it either. And Sweden are making their own tests, and so is Israel. So, so in order to fight the virus, the herd immunity is not the issue. The issue is containment, get it, pushing it down. You know, looking after it, making sure it's not spreading uncontrollably, and 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 tracking it, uh, and, and using face mask. Anything that can lower it is going to be a different mix. Tracking people, face masks, uh, social distancing, but getting people back to work in a selective way, in a careful way, uh, letting it up, but but in a controlled fashion. I think that's what is going to happen in Israel. You cannot let it out and just send people back to work. In the U.S., it's going to be a disaster. I, my belief, that's without being an epidemiologist, when you have, uh, when you're letting it out without reaching a threshold or, or, or dropping the amount, you said you are having less people coming in than, uh, than, than, than being sick, uh, you're recovering than being sick, then, then you can start letting down. But, but if you do it in the U.S., that, that you have an increase still or peaks to come and you let up, it's going to be an explosion. We understand that. Everybody understands that. 
As a doctor, can you tell us uh, what treatments are being used in Sweden for uh, infected uh, patients, both at early, medium stage and also later stage? Um, is the contra controversial drug, the hydroxychloroquine, being prescribed for early stage uh, uh, patients? And also, in your opinion, how important is a vaccine? Everybody talks about a vaccine, but how important is a vaccine, considering that, for instance, that SARS disappeared without a vaccine? Yeah, it relates to to uh, what I said what I said before. There's a lot of trials in Sweden on different. The chloroquine had had damaging effects also on the heart. There are very few controlled studies because controlled studies takes time, and and you need to have a system to do it. So uh, Sweden is very like con, con, very very let's say conservative in in in. Uh, in, in the way they perform these studies. I know in Israel there is a lot of, of testing and, and you're sort of quicker, quicker on the trigger, happier on the trigger to do things. And I know several trials where you do anti, antioxidant, um, using antioxidant strategies and so on, but they are not controlled. So we really don't know. Uh, the chloroquine had got a bad reputation here and I, I, I think they stopped doing it. They stopped the study because they, they saw heart heart effects and other other things, effects bad effects on the heart. I don't know if they use it on 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 early stage. Um, I'm 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 not really. Um, it's a lot about keeping the oxygen, keeping the inflammation down, um, and and I think that there's a lot of things uh, being tried and experimented, but there's very little data, and, and people don't come out with the data and and say anything until. Um, they have something that they they can stand behind, so that's um, that's that's uh, not going to happen. There are ventilator, there are people um, in ventilators, but but what we did not discuss, and and I think the the, the vaccine, an efficient vaccine is going to be eighteen months, twelve months. First, you need to validate it, you need to test it, you, and you need to produce it, and then you need to distribute it. And these things takes time. I'm, I'm a CEO of a medical company. I know the kind of procedures you need to do, and you cannot let things out into the public that might be more harmful than helpful. So you need to you need to establish that the vaccine is is more helpful than harmful, and you need to prove that. And then you need to make it in a safe way. And you need to distribute it in a safe way. So all those things will take time. So we, we're looking at at least a year away if if we're not lucky. I know uh, there's an Israeli company who 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 was trying an oral vaccine. Uh, if that works, that could be a very fast way. We don't know yet. They're they're trying it, so that that could be a quicker way. But saying all this, uh, I think the strategy of of containing the virus that's what you did with SARS. That's how you 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 very quickly closed down, isolated people, tracked the people with SARS. SARS was not as contagious. Uh, um, and and it was very deadly, but it was less contagious, so it was easy to contain, easier to contain. This is a very very contagious uh, virus, so it's very hard to contain. So it's it's going to be time, and and you need to combine several things. Like I think you, you're doing in Israel, you're doing in other countries like Australia, uh, Norway, Denmark. Um, I think I think a lot a combination of these measures, and and and. And then the other factor, what's going to happen in Sweden, is what you dis the la this week they are starting to discuss the the rehabilitation of all these people being in ventilators. And the more people you have sick, the more people you have on ventilators. The rehabilitation is very very long. Your your body is totally broken after two weeks in a ventilator, and it takes months and maybe six months to rehabilitate after long ventilator uh, uh, treatment. So are you are you saying that you know all the world, uh, wherever you are, whether it's prime ministers, presidents, uh, governors of states, or whatever, uh, the the demand was out for having ventilators all the time. But you have a theory that uh, because ventilators are used on uh, people in late stages, that in fact the ventilators have, uh, in certain cases, in fact uh, advanced the the death of, of certain patients on, on ventilators, that in, in fact ventilators could be detrimental 
because no, it, no. you have a, a medical theory on that? No, th that's that's not what I'm saying. I'm saying every, everybody knows being on a ventilator is is a, is a very a tough on the body. That's why they don't put people with multiple diseases on ventilators because they can't cope with it. That's not. But younger people can cope. But it's a long rehabilitation. What I'm saying is that uh, having a high high degree of of the population being infected by, by COVID will increase the number of people, pure statistics, having to be on ventilators. And that in, in itself will create costs and, and, and pressure on the healthcare system in the post rehabilitation treatment. By pushing down the numbers and decreasing the amount of people on ventilators, you also decrease the post effects on it. You might have other effects like suicide and, and drinking problems because of isolation. But there are also effects of having a big part of the population becoming sick because it, it creates a pressure on the healthcare system in the aftermath, definitely. Now, well, in Israel, as you said before, um, the Bari land, for instance, has a new technology that uh, reduces diagnostic time down to just uh, 15 minutes. And in Israel, Israeli scientists at Magal are making progress on a vaccine, that's something we just discussed, mm -hmm. up yeah. in the north of Israel. Teva's also advancing uh, certain uh, things that would help against this, this particular vi uh, virus. Is there any sort of similar advances that are, are taking place in Sweden with by... Swedish scientists, biologists. Sure, 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 sure. sure. I mean, the, the the Karolinska Institute, the bacteriology lab, <coughs> are creating and testing. Uh, they're testing external uh, tests, but they're also creating their own tests to 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 be able to increase the testing. And they they have by the government been uh, authorized to to produce these tests. Uh, there are studies going on. There there, there is a lot. There are uh, several groups in the virology. You know, we have we have uh, very famous research places here too, and and they are of course uh, very active, and they get funding for this. Um, so so Israel is a little quicker, um, uh, and and the government is maybe a little more proactive with regards to giving grants for for things. I, in our company, we over a month ago got a got a memo says, in what way can you help the COVID? Um, uh, uh, can your product be helpful in the in the epidemic? We got a such from the um, from the Ministry of, of Finance. You know what 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 way can you can you help with the Israeli innovation authorities? I tried to import and help and and offered uh, personal protection uh, equipment from a Korean uh, company that we collaborate with who are um, FDA approved, CE approved, Korean FDA, they have personal protection equipment and testing. And I offered it to Karolinska to the central purchasing. I got very little answers. And nobody called me and followed up on, you know, who are you? How can we get it? It was like, we are taking care of, we, we're doing all this. Uh, and I felt it was kind of passive. So th there is a, uh, the, 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 the research community have, are, are basically independent on the politics and they, they do what, what they, they have in big international collaboration. They're probably working together with U.S. and Israeli researchers today. Uh, and, and the healthcare system is, is a very good healthcare system. Uh, but there is a, the, the, on, on the central level being you know, quick footed, you know, moving quickly, being less bureaucratic, I think that's uh, very problematic. However, Israeli authorities can be very bureaucratic. I have dealt with the Israel economic, uh, but they are very much into the detail. They go in and, and mix with the actual execution. And here, the Swedish politicians and they do, there, there is a div division who does what, and you don't step on it because for legal reason, you cannot step in and take over. So it's separated in Sweden in a much more, uh, you know, organized way. But when there is a crisis and you need to sort of have a cohesive uh, action plan, that is a hindrance in the Swedish society and the Swe how it's built. Because we didn't have the war. We didn't need to do that. It's, everything was like a machine. It's like a big tanker has to turn. And I could compare that to uh, Israelis, which is like a, a bunch of patrol boats that can turn very quickly and, and change direction. Yeah. 
So, so this, you're comparing a tanker with small patrol boats, and this is how it's all structured and this, the, 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 the background. It's not that Swedes are, are less active or so on, but there are um, less a sense of urgency is not maybe in, in always in the Swedish mind. This is one of the things that Israel, as you and I know, we've just celebrated our 72nd birthday in Israel, but we're, uh, we're actually a young and very nimble uh, uh, country. That's why we, we pride ourselves on being the startup nation with its innovation. And we have a government, again, led by Bibi, who is a, a free market economist who uh, give the incentives to uh, all these startups and, uh, and whatever. And this is, uh, has become a driving force for Israel itself. But while we're talking about this, how, why don't you tell us about uh, your own medical company that's based in Israel? Where's it based? What's it doing? We, 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 uh, we, uh, the, 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 I got into the company um, um, actually, it started in the synagogue. So I met someone who met someone else. This is how it does in Israel. You meet someone, you share experiences, you try to help out. And in the end, I, I invested in a company um, um, that, that, and I actually changed, um, changed the direction we had. It was, it was, it was a, like, a, it started with a condom, actually. But I, I, I worked in the hospital and and, and uh, I had a nightmare uh, when I worked there 40 years ago as a, as a nurse um, uh, collecting urine. And, and I said this, I wanted to change this condom to a urine collection device. And, and the founder and I agreed that we were going to do that. So we created uh, first the urine collection device for men that's external and wouldn't leak because this is a problem. And then we went on and created um, a, a, an external urine collection device for women. Uh, incontinent women, elderly women, this is a huge problem because they get wounds and there is an overuse of catheters, which gives infections to elderly women and they die. So our, our, this catheter, who is now on the way out to, to the market, we have a distributor in, in Israel, we have distributors in the US and we are working to get uh, here in Sweden too, and we have production. Uh, it, it's a, it's a, a urine catheter um, that sits on the outside. Uh, collects urine and you don't get wet. Uh, you don't get these diaper rashes. You can. You don't have to change in the middle of the night and 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 wake up the patient. You need less staff in the old age home nighttime, and in the hospitals you 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 don't need to put a catheter in uh, to to collect the urine. You can use our device to collect and measure urine for for women who maybe have diuretics and heart problems and so on. And that decreases uh, infection risk and and staff. And actually, in this COVID-19 uh, virus pandemic, um, this device has a really has a potential to um, uh, carry or decrease the, the number of contacts between staff and 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 uh, patients. So the, the risk of, of of propagating the virus is decreased to to contagion. Um, so we are we are, but now everybody, it's so chaotic out there. So we are trying to get pilots into different places for, for them to help them out. But I think in a few weeks we will, we will start pilots. We, we already tested it in, in Laniado Hospital in Israel. We are doing, uh, we have it on the market in, in the US and it works um, very well. So it's a very exciting, uh, uh, exciting product and can really help a lot of people. I'm uh, interested. So here you mentioned Lanyado Hospital, that's based yeah. here in Netanyahu, where I'm speaking to you from. That's very good. Oh, yeah, we are. They are our. Uh, <laughs> they are but our... I'm always very keen to help uh, promote uh, new Israeli innovation. So tell us, what, what's the name of your company? And if anybody of our viewers wants to know more about it, where, when they can, can they, where can they go to? Is there a website or yeah. is there an email yeah. address where yeah. people can learn about it or even maybe invest in the company and, yeah. and learn more about it? Yeah, our, our email address is, the company's name is Tilla Care. Uh, you see the name, you see the name under, under my name, you see the name Tilla Care. And you just go to www.tillacare.com. And there you have an address to my Swedish address. We have a use address. We have an Israeli address there. And you can send a mail to us for a request. Uh, we are looking for distribution and sales channels globally. 
and uh, and we are collaborating with so we can we can channel and we can produce devices. Um, we also have an instruction movie. So if you come to our homepage, we can send you to and show you how exactly how to deploy the device and so on. Uh, it's it's uh, we are we are just finishing around an investment round now and actually uh, closing it right now. Um, so during the COVID epidemics to get uh, to raise a substantial number of, of, of dollars are quite exciting. Um, but I think there is there is a big need and a big potential for this product, and it really can help a lot of people to have a higher, better quality of life, not being wet, not you know the smell all these problems. And actually from an environmental problem, diaper is a huge problem with transportation and storage and, and landfills. And we, we can decrease that. We can't substitute all of it, but we can decrease that and we can uh, probably decrease a lot, lot of the hospital acquired infections through catheter that you get from catheters. So we are, we are, I'm very excited about it and I'm putting a lot of energy and effort into, into this uh, uh, company and working with Israeli team and Swedish team and American, it's a very uh, rewarding. I have like one foot in Israel and one foot here in Sweden, and my wife is American, so it it's uh, it's pretty. Uh, I have a good time. <laughs> That's very good, excellent. Good luck with it. I mean, thank but thank you, thank you very very much for for joining me. It was nice to meet with you out there. I hope we get to meet personally, either if I get ever get to Sweden or if when next time you're in Israel. Uh, thank you for the contribution and uh, and thank viewers. Um, I hope you enjoyed my chat with Dr. Michael Conn. I hope you found it interesting and instructive. If there's anything there that you need to know about it you, or further, you can contact me at theviewfromisrael at gmail.com and look out for the link and spread it and share the information that Dr. Conn has given us with your friends and acquaintances. Thank you. This is Barry Shaw, The View from Israel, signing off from Israel. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Okay, Lawrence. Where is he? <laughs> he I think he's gone. He fell asleep. <laughs> I think you and I may have been talking to each other and he's not recording it. <laughs> oh. <laughs> uh, okay, how was it? Yeah.